Hello there, welcome back to the next part of my little video here, session three. Talking about Araman, he's one of my primordials in my game world, the vaults. And in this uh, second part of session three, I'm going to be talking about his clerics, his true believers. We're talking about devotees, devotee, uh, devotees of Araman, this, this fiendish genie primordial entity that wants payback against the gods and all their works, all their constructs, the, the mortals that they've created uh, and the, the works of their mortals because the gods screwed over the genies and Araman was like their leader. So Araman, he wants to get the rest of his brothers and sisters free of those accursed bottles that genies were stuffed into by the gods and gifted to mortals of all things. So let's go ahead and take a look at his clerics, those most devout, perhaps, of his worshipers. Most of what I'm about to show you is, you know, straight up some homebrew stuff. So let's let's cover some of the basics first. Domains. So in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, just like in 5th Edition D&D, clerics have a domain. Well, their gods have a domain, and that is like the sphere of influence that the god oversees or is interested in. So for Araman, these first three are out of the book. Uh, player core, you can find these. Uh, I think they're all in the remastered version. But Destruction, Freedom, and Trickery. So these you can look up in, in that book or just in second edition rules. Uh, destruction is... Araman's a harbinger of upheaval. Uh, he wants to break shit. Pardon my French. Uh, and tear it down, obliterate things, dismantle you know the works of the gods. So the clerics who are worshipping him in this domain, they are going to be able to channel destructive energy, unmake structures, objects, even concepts that represent order, stability, that sort of thing. Then there's the freedom domain. Uh, this is, you know, could be fairly benign, right? You're you're talking about freeing people that have been enslaved, oppressed. There's tyrannical organizations that are got people under their thumb, sort of a thing. So clerics that are dedicated to that domain, they're empowered to break free from control, liberate other people, resist domination, resist tyranny. So kind of good guys, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but they're probably not afraid to break some stuff on the way in or murder some people if they, you know, are tyrants. So maybe not so good. Trickery. That's the third domain. Uh, a lot of what Araman and his followers are about is um, what I was talking about, I think, in the last video was rabble rousing. They are trying to uh, promote anarchy, unrest, civil unrest, right? They want people to question the divinities. They want them to question their rulers, their, you know, these divinely ordained kings or queens or whatever it is, right? They, they don't, they want all that stuff torn down. Uh, so in order to do it, part of it isn't just go and destroy it or smash chains or something like that. They can trick people, although it's not trickery in the sense of necessarily, um, bad tricking uh it could certainly be like hey look at your society look at this this king you're you know your 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 uh is your sovereign whatever look at the god you're worshiping they're lying to you and so they're using this manipulation right they're using this this subterfuge uh and it because it could be lies it could be true uh, it depends on whose perspective you're looking at but they're they're just trying to sow confusion and deception and discord and and, you know, they're not out there, you know, trying to say, yo, I'm trying to burn it all down. So they're going to keep their own intentions hidden for the most part. Uh, but they're definitely going to try to to stir the pot. And if trickery is the way to do it, they're going to do it that way as well. So these are the three, you know, uh, bread and butter basic domains. The next one gets into my, one of my first homebrews here, and that is chaos and anarchy is the fourth domain. And oddly enough, maybe some of you are going, what do you mean? That's that's not a, a domain in the book. No, it's not a domain in the book. I'm, I'm shocked. At least I've looked everywhere. I haven't seen it. Uh, so I don't think it exists. It does now, at least for me. Chaos and Anarchy. So this domain, uh, this is, you know, those followers of Araman that are that are embracing this true concept of, you know, chaos, the, the, the 
universal concept. Um, and the idea that, you know, the universe is ever changing, it's unpredictable. And so is the works of men and the works of the gods, because it's all based upon the same, you know, atomic structure, or whatever, right? So they're able to invoke the chaos. They're able to dis use it to disrupt and confound enemies. They're able to harness it to create unexpected uh, transformative effects. Uh, and here are a couple of domain spells. So if you don't know anything about domain spells, if you, in Pathfinder, if, when you choose your deity, and this is one of the cool things I like with Pathfinder over d d is in Pathfinder, you have a cleric who chooses a god and the gods have domains associated with them that then have some of the abilities you're seeing here. Uh, in D&D, it's you choose your domain and then from there find a god who matches it. But the domain is what's giving you the extra stuff and then not really the god. So it's kind of a little bit backwards if you ask me. But anyway, domain, chaos, anarchy, depending on which, you know, is it the universal chaos or is it the the material world anarchy concept here but you get domain spells uh when you choose your 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 deity and these are focus spells so focus spells would be abilities that are above and beyond spells uh they're kind of like um like in dnd terms for those of you that are are you know dnd fans uh it's like the abilities you get with your class you know or your race that you can use once a day once an hour after short rest they come back after a long rest whatever right uh they're known as focus spells and you can get them back you have to spend focus points to use them and you have a limited pool of focus points uh, i think you have like a maximum of three focus points if if i'm remembering correctly so anyway uh at first level if you take the Chaos Anarchy domain, you'd be given Touch of Chaos and have a focus point with which to use or cast this, this ability. So Touch of Chaos, it's a misfortune effect, uh, and that would translate into d d terms as a disadvantage. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, there's not all this advantage-disadvantage like you'd have in d d There's fortune and misfortune. Uh, and the main way you get it is through a hero point in Pathfinder. Each session usually starts with one hero point. But there are other things in the game that apply fortune and misfortune. But it's not like everything in D&D is, you know, advantage, 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 disadvantage, disadvantage. You know, it's not like that at all. You have usually one way of getting a fortune effect, and that's your hero point. Or in this case, Touch of Chaos allows you to put misfortune upon a creature that you are uh you don't have to yeah you have to touch them so you have to touch them uh i don't think you need to make an attack roll i'll have to double check my mechanical notes but i think it's just you spend an action bang they get misfortune they roll the next time they roll d20 they gotta roll twice lowest number you know disadvantage right uh chaos blade the fourth level, you get another focus ability, Chaos Blade. That's why it says Focus 4. And this allows you to infuse one of your weapons with anarchic energy, uh, or void energy, I guess would be the most equivalent. In the Pathfinder 2nd Edition before the remaster, there was chaotic damage, but begin with no more alignment. There's no more alignment damage, uh, which is kind of a shame, at least in this example here. This is one of the ones I was kind of struggling with a little bit because... How do you explain void damage as, as chaos, you know? That's kind of where I'm a little bit, hmm. How do you, how do you, those two don't exactly match. Uh, but anyway, I mean, void damage to me is more like negative, uh, you know, dark, shadowy damage. Not necessarily chaos, disruption, disrupting the molecular structure of the target sort of things, the way I envision chaos. But uh, for this ability, you infuse a weapon, it's going to deal bonus void damage on a hit. And it only applies to weapons that can deal damage, so it can't be like you hit them with a towel or something like that, right? But you, the other cool thing is you can pass this weapon to one of your allies. And then the heightening is talking about at a higher level, the effects of these, these focus spells increase or improve. So that's what that's referring to. So that is that is my homebrewed version of Chaos Anarchy domain for this particular uh, group of people that worships Aramon. You, you just got to have it. If you're going to have an anarchy uh, entity, you need an anarchy domain. Come on. All right, let's continue. 
we're going to get into doctrines. So in Pathfinder, there's two doctrines that you choose. This would kind of be like subclasses in D&D. Uh, so you can either go cloistered do uh, doctrine, which is, you know, sort of your bookish style of priest. And then you've got the war priest, which is your more your frontline fightery type uh, cleric. So the cloistered cleric of Araman is known as a herald of freedom. And what the picture is representing and the way I'm envisioning these guys, these guys are your, your behind the scenes, rabble rousing, rumor mongering, literature distributing, you know, uh, anarchy promoting priests, right? They are on a path of anarchy. They're, they're studying uh, how anarchy works, how, you know, the, the philosophical side of that sort of thing the methodology uh behind it and how to sow discord even better that's what that's talking about chaos and fusion that would be more of a raw uh you know power where you're able to channel chaos itself and its energies uh they're able to imbue this energy into objects that sort of thing and just see how it manifests in this unpredictable more you know universal and uh manner uh, then there's divination of discord. This one's kind of interesting, I think, because it allow these guys are able to divine things. You know, Araman, show me the truth. But they divine it through chaos, and so rather than you don't necessarily have to think, oh, there's some chaotic ritual swirling energy. One of the cool ideas I was having: what if the divination technique was, and this is the one thing could be, you know, hey, roll the bones and whatever the the knuckle bones roll. That could be a sort of form of randomness, chaos, but. I was thinking unconventional method like um, going along with the idea of anarchy. What if uh, one way that they they divine truth is they they get a they get a they get a, a riot going right, and then they're just kind of observing it from let's say the rooftop and just watching all the chaos of people smashing windows and burning stores or whatever and beating down some you know the 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 city watch or whatever right. And just the movements and the chaos, that is what they're interpreting, you know, as they're, as they're looking down upon just the the arson that's raging, you know. That could be a really cool uh, concept for how these guys could could learn the future sort of a thing. So that was an interesting way, I think, of of applying this. Uh, and then the fourth thing, they and here's kind of where I think you could look at them as just straight up good guys. Uh, they, they're guardians of liberation. So if there's, you know, something like enslavement going on, you got um, some tyrannical organization going on, these guys are going to be the one that is sticking up for, you know, the slaves and trying to free people and and out on the street corner preaching how, you know, uh, this this law is bad or this this construct of our society is wrong and it's discriminatory, that sort of thing. Um you know, the kind of thing if you think about uh, just civil rights sort of stuff. You could see these guys, you know, leading those types of marches sort of a thing. Uh, and, you know, they're they're not afraid, of course, to get their hands dirty because they're fighting against what they believe is total, you know, tyranny and evil, in their opinion. All right, so that is, that's sort of their, their, their tenets. That's kind of their belief structure. How does this manifest in mechanics is what's next. Well, the first one is the the first doctrine, and all clerics, you know, depending regardless of the god or the domain, they get the first, they get this set of doctrines, right? They get I think it's six total doctrines that you unlock at different levels. Uh, so the first doctrine is the same for all cloistered clerics. You get the domain initiate fee, and then what I've tried to do, and it's it doesn't start yet, but in the later doctrines, I have a second bullet point that adds a homebrewed extra flavor to the doctrine. Uh, you've heard me talk about kind of one of the disappointing things a little bit uh, with Pathfinder is because the game is trying to appeal to so many, um, you know, people, right? It's got to appeal to everybody. Uh, it, by that, you know, nature, it has to be generic. It has to be vanilla in a lot of areas. So if you're homebrewing, you can make things more specific to your game role that, um, you know, Paizo couldn't do for everybody and everything, and their otherwise their books would be like a thousand pages long. So anyway, I digress. I have homebrew options that match my game world that match the doctrine. So the rather than the doctrine is just kind of being plain, vanilla, 
basic stuff. Oh, you get plus one to this. You get training in that. You get those things already, and then you get a little bit of extra thing to give some flavor to the doctrines and the doctrine here, these heralds of freedom. So first doctrine, first level, you get the domain initiate feat. That is the one that gives you access to your, your um, those, I believe it's the focus spells. Uh, so domain initiate feat, let me just double check that before I get called a liar. Be right back. Okay, yeah, just double check the player core I was right. So this gives you your access to those domain spells, those focus spells I was talking about right here. So if you are the Chaos Anarchy domain and you're a cloistered cleric at first level, you get your first doctrine and the domain initiate is a feat that you would get access to for free. And then that gives you that level one focus spell that you see here, the Touch of Chaos. You don't get the level four focus spell unless you, I think you have to take a different feat later that allows you to access it. Uh, but anyway, I digress. And then the second part of this is, it's this is just standard. Uh, you get to pick the, especially what I just said, you get to pick the domain spell from that domain. Okay, nothing new fancy here. Now, the second doctrine, I am going to start getting some new fancy stuff. Uh, Anarchic Resilience is what the sec. By the way, I gave each of these like a little flavorful name, right? The first doctrine. It's not just the first. I studied the first doctrine. You study Entropy's Call as your first doctrine. So you can imagine it's kind of maybe some role play sort of stuff, right? As a, as a cleric player and your game starts to level up, you know, you can have a, a trainer, a high priest that's like brother or sister. Tell me, speak to me, what is our first doctrine? You know, and they have to recite it as the call of entr entropy. It means that I blah, 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 touch of chaos. Excellent work. Kind of role play that, right? Or during a level up session. Anyway, second doctrine. Uh, excuse me. Uh, second jo doctrine. By the way, these doctrine unlocks are not second level. The doctrines unlock at... Ooh, let me pause real quick because I don't want to lie again. One second. All right, found it. It's uh, 1, 3, 7, 11, 15, and 19 are the levels that you unlock these. So this would be a third level. Uh, you get Anarchic Resilience. The first bullet, as I just mentioned, that's stock, that's you know raw, that's I'm not making anything new here. You get Proficiency. Uh, and fortitude goes from, uh, increases up to expert. I think you started trained. So now you're expert. Uh, anyway, but the next part is my, my flavor. So my flavor goes with this anarchic resilience. Additionally, due to your understanding of chaos, you get a plus one circumstance bonus to all saves against effects that attempt to physically control or manipulate your actions or position. Uh, so this might require some GM interpretation here, but I wanted to kind of make it a little bit loose. Uh, I guess I could go in and name every single condition, like the grabbed condition or the reposition type of thing. So it allows you to not be held, uh, moved, you know, tied up, whatever. It has to be a physical control. So not a magical control, but a physical push, shove, trip, whatever you want to say. All those different effects. So it give you a plus one bonus. That's what it's doing for you. So no game breaking thing, but it's you know a little something something that makes uh, makes makes it a little more fun to be this particular domain. All right, then we got the third doctrine. Uh, this is abnormality sensitive, and I'm not sure I really like this name too well. It's it's, it's kind of rubbing me a little bit. Like I don't say wrong, but I like it's abnormality. You'll see in a second what I mean. And you're sensitive. Um, so I'm trying to I, I was trying to find some synonyms to uh, chaos. Okay. So cut me some slack. But anyway, third doctrine, proficiency, spell attack, modifier, spell DC, great. Uh, but here's the, the extra little fluff here. You get the ability to sense the anomalous energy associated with creatures not native to this world as a spell-like ability. Once per day, you can spend 10 minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, in meditation, heightening your sensitivity to the presence of abnormal energies as well as your innate understanding of such creatures. For the next hour, you gain a plus one circumstance bonus to recall knowledge, seek or sense motive actions used against creatures with the aberration, astral, celestial, elemental, fey, fiend, shadow, void, vitality trait. Traits, I guess. Uh, I don't know if there's a collective term for all those. I know, I think once upon a time was outsider. 
I don't know if that's still a thing in Pathfinder 2nd Edition or not. We don't have the monster core yet for me to confirm this. So I labeled all the stuff out here that I that I could think of. So long story short, if it's a creature that's not from the prime plane, I guess would be the way to think about it, then you get a bonus to, to do these things against it. So maybe I need to just word it that way. If it's not from the prime planet, I don't know. So that's what I got, right? So that's what I mean. You're sensitive to abnormalities or this abnormal vibe you're getting from. Not abnormality like physical defects or something like that. So that's why I got, I'm not sure 100% about this anomaly detector. I don't know how to word it so it doesn't sound too sci-fi either. All right, let's continue. Fourth doctrine, the Herald of Freedom. Uh, unpredictable strike. Now, Full disclosure, this uh, artwork is AI generated and you can probably tell because there's three arms, but, but this actually works for this particular ability here. And this is the reason why I, I kept it. Uh, if you don't know anything about AI art generators, they, I don't say often, but they can sometimes put weird physical defects or something in the artwork, extra arms, legs, missing fingers, that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, I kept it because it kind of fits this idea of unpredictable strike and chaos, right? Imagine now you're starting to channel some of that chaotic energy, so much so that it's almost warping your body or something, right? I kind of like this idea. So, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the first bullet points because henceforth, they're just what you'd find in the player core. Uh, the second bullet point I want to focus on. So the second bullet point is this. Uh, additionally to what you get up there, once a day you can perform a hour ritual to infuse a weapon or object with chaotic energy, causing it to produce random effects like unpredictable sounds or colors that can distract enemies, granting you and your allies a plus one circumstance bonus to stealth checks, to sneak or deception checks to create a diversion. So, I don't know, I mean... You know, maybe this picture doesn't fit that as well as I was thinking, but I kind of like just whatever. Maybe I, I'll find I'll find a place where I kind of like the idea that just whatever. There's a weird, you know, something, something. Maybe if I had it like unpredictable strike as in it gave you a plus one bonus to hit because people are going, dude, you got three arms. You know, well, how are you hitting me? But the, the basic idea is this, that your weapon or something is flashing or glowing or I don't know. And that distracts. So you can do like deception, create diversion, or you could put it on, let's say an object um, and, you know, toss it down the, down the hallway or something like that. Uh, and that might allow you to sneak past uh, whoever it is, you know, something like that is, is the idea. All right, let's keep going. Fifth doctrine, master of mayhem. Uh, reflecting your deep understanding of the effects of chaos on the mind, you can cast a variant of the Confusion spell once per week. I think Confusion is a third or fourth level spell. Uh, but this has a contagious effect. So on your turn, you can spend an action to cause any creature suffering... Okay, so you cast the Confusion spell first is what you do, right? Then, and I might have to reword this a little bit, but then once the Confusion is taken hold... Uh, you can spend an action on your turn to cause anybody who's confused from the original confusion to spread their condition to another creature within spell range. That creature gets the will save as if it was the original creature. So the way this works is let's say I cast a confused spell, I get somebody confused, then I can take an action and go, that confusion is going to jump to somebody else within that range. I think it's like a 30 foot range. Uh, so it's supposed to be within that 30 feet of you. So it's going to jump. They have to then make a save, and then they might get confused. Uh, but once you're confused, you're immune to it. So you can't just keep going confused, confused, and keep going back and forth between the two people. So it's like a, a one and done. Once you are confused, or once you make your save throw, you can't be confused again by this for like an hour or something like that, or a day. I don't know. All right, then the last doctrine, the final doctrine at level 19, Herald of Freedom are going to get, Heralds of Freedom are going to get the Avatar of Chaos. Uh, so this one, the second part of this is once per day, you can use your the spell-like ability Warp Reality in your choice of a 10-foot emanation, so like a burst around you, or a 60-foot line altering the terrain of the area. The terrain becomes a different type of terrain, like 
aquatic, arctic, whatever, desert, and becomes normal or difficult terrain as you choose. Structures, general geographic features, and creatures in the area aren't transformed, but creatures in the area take 5d6 void damage as reality tries to bend them along with the terrain. Um, so you're pretty much just warping the ground, you know, rather than like a building that's there. Uh, but void damage will be dealt to the creatures. Through though changes in the area are permanent, the natural environment might eventually revert. So that would be kind of weird. Like you're turning, let's say, a cavern in the under earth here. I guess you could turn it into like a, a pond or a lake or whatever, like a frozen Arctic. That'd be kind of freakish as people walked in like, what the hell just happened here? All right, so there you go. That is the final doctrine for these cloistered doctrine, the Heralds of Freedom. Let's go ahead and take a look at the War Priest doctrine for Aramon's devotees, his clerics. I'm calling these the Vanguards of Havoc. Their beliefs are here, chaotic warriors. These war priests embody Araman's disruptive, unpredictable nature. The combat style is unorthodox, chaotic, makes them unpredictable and dangerous. They have unpredictable combat. They believe in embracing chaos of battle, using erratic, surprising maneuvers that confound enemies. Martial prowess is as much about sowing confusion as it is, is about effectiveness. So they're not necessarily like, I need a bigger, badder weapon. They're like just trying to get people confused and looking around and not sure what to do. Uh, and then maybe they're slitting your throat while you're unsure what's happening. Agents of Disruption. The War Priests of Araman might also gain unique abilities to channel chaotic energies in the battle, using them for offense and to disrupt enemy formations. They could unleash bursts of chaotic energy, warp the terrain momentarily, create illusions to mislead foes, that sort of stuff. Aura of Anarchy. Their presence in the battlefield is unsettling and disorienting. They exude an aura that reflects their commitment to chaos and liberation, which could unnerve enemies or embolden allies. All right, let's take a look at their doctrine abilities at first level. Uh, now this one, I did homebrew the second part of this because uh, I think it fits better. Vanguard of Havoc, first doctrine. Uh, this, by the way, War Priest got a little bit of a revamp in the remaster. So I'm going to kind of go through this a little bit more detail than I was with the, um, the cloistered. Uh, so Chaotic Strike is the name of the first doctrine. You're trained in light and medium armor. And you have expert proficiency and fortitude saves. You also gain the shield block general feat. So that is, you know, War Priest, everybody's getting that. The second part is a variation, uh, a homebrew option that I'm putting in here. So you get the Divine Castigation Cleric feat. That Now the Divine Castigation feat, by the way, let me, I'm going to have to pull this up so everybody knows what I'm talking about. Divine Castigation. Here it is. Let me share this real quick. Do, do, do. Go over here. And I'm going to move this up. Make sure I'm on the right page still. Okay. I'm going to try to get this thing zoomed in a little bit for you guys. Hold on a second. Do, 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 escape that divine castigation zoom okay should work now move this up let me hide this boom there it is divine castigation all right so here's what it is uh your deity's grace doesn't extend to your sworn enemies when you cast a harm or heal spell you can add your holy or unholy trait to it if you do the spell deals damage to creatures with the opposing trait even if it wouldn't normally damage them. The spell deals spirit damage when used in this way. For example, if you are holy, you could add the holy trait to the heal spell and deal spirit damage to a fiend that has the unholy trait. So with Araman's followers, you would have the unholy trait. So you could add unholy to your harm spell. And then if you hit somebody or touch somebody who has the holy trait, they would take spirit damage okay that's the the way divine castigation works now where it's different is the way my variant works here this only works through your favored weapon so araman's favored weapon is a whip it's a barbed whip so the war priests are big into you know carrying around their weapon this this um 
favored weapon, the barbed whip. So the harm spell only works through uh, the whip. So it's kind of like a like a smite, right? So when you when you whip with your your barbed whip, your your divine weapon here, you're able to then shoot the harm spell through it. So you're going to use the whip as your attack. Bang! You hit. They have to. Uh, they don't have to make the the fort save anymore. They just get hit by the whip. They take the whip damage, and then they're taking the harm spell damage. Okay, everything else then just matches the harm spell from there. So the difference is with harm, right? You'd have to cast the spell. They'd make a save, fort save, and then you know whatever would happen. With this, you're swinging your weapon to hit them, and if you hit, you can then uh, use this this feat here. Is the way I'm looking at this. Uh, so maybe I need to reword this a little bit so that I say it's an action, an extra action. So, you know, maybe it's the combined action, I guess. But I guess I'd hate to have it. You lose it if if you miss. I can look at the particular rules here. But, but that was the idea, right? Uh, and then at 13th level, you get Divine Defense, which is the stock ability. That's not anything I added. Okay. So anyway, that's the first Doctrine, Chaotic Strike. I think I renamed that to, to something else. I don't know. I gotta go check my other notes. I don't think I'm calling. It... See what I mean? Everything's chaotic, chaotic, chaotic. Um, you need, you need, you need some, you know, variation here. So let me just double check. So I thought I had chaotic lash is what I was calling it. So chaotic lash. That's a little bit better, right? Strikes and stuff. Lash, chaotic lash. Next doctrine: the erratic defense, the vanguard of havoc. You're trained in martial weapons. Uh, and then you've learned this erratic defense. You've learned to incorporate chaotic movements into your combat style that puts your enemy that put your enemies off guard. Whenever you make an attack with a martial weapon, you can use a reaction to impose a minus two penalty on the next attack roll made against. And I believe the whip is a martial weapon. Let me just clarify that before you're like, dude, you can't use your weapon. Uh, yes, it is a martial melee weapon. So the whip is a martial weapon so if you combine it here whenever you make an attack with your whip you can use a reaction to impose a minus two penalty on the next attack roll made against you before the start of your next turn it should probably from the the enemy you just smacked with it not any old enemy so that's one thing i need to clarify there is it should come from the enemy that you are attacking not just any old rando on the battlefield here so those little things you catch as you're going through these videos. It's one thing I kind of like about doing them. All right, so I've got that. Uh, minus two penalty to the next attack roll made again uh, from that creature. Something like that. So you're trained in martial weapons. You've learned to incorporate chaotic movements in the combat. Whenever you make a whip... Whenever you make an attack with a martial weapon, you can use a reaction to impose a minus two penalty to the next attack roll from your target. From your target. There we go. To impose a minus two penalty to your target's next attack roll. Sorry, I'm doing this in real time. To your target's, while well, it's on my mind, next attack roll made against you before the end of your next turn all right i guess that makes sense okay done next next cry havoc uh i really like this picture by the way um you know when i first saw it i was like oh is this destro or, or like it's uh too sci-fi ish but then in my game world i've got uh the the gear forge the war forge which i call the tinkertons not to be confused with the pinkertons that came and took your magic cards uh, but the tinkertons and the tinkertons are constructs they're you know old world constructs so they're kind of the robots that the the dwarven kingdom once deployed anyway they're in the game so when i saw this i'm going oh man i never even thought like a tinkerton could be a a cleric of Araman, that would be like so a construct machine is worshiping a chaos god uh primordial genie that doesn't like 
constructs societal constructs. I don't know. I just kind of thought it was cool. The picture looks pretty sweet. And I'm just thinking, well, I'm going to keep this. So Cry Havoc, once a day is a free action. You can shout an aphorism. Now, aphorisms are, you know, gods and magic. It's essentially your, your I don't say prayer. It's that, you know, Lord, give me strength type of call. Uh, so you can shout an aphorism. Again, get some role play option here for a player. Uh, and then it infuses the, the deity's favorite weapon with chaotic energy, causing it to deal an additional 1d6 energy damage. And it's random, so it could be fire, could be uh, lightning, cold, whatever. So it's a random bit of energy damage. Uh, and actually, what I was, thinking, I was almost thinking I might change the void damage from earlier into, into this sort of an effect. Uh, but because the genies are all based upon elements, this makes sense. And viewing elements as a form of chaos, that then makes sense. So that's what I'm talking about here. It's just a random bit of energy damage. Uh, so anyway, you could do that, causing it to deal additional D6 on the first hit you land each round for a minute. Okay, so that's what that's all about. Uh, Vanguard of Havoc, Fourth Doctrine, Rebellious Resistance. This one's another freaky picture, and it could be another one of the uh, Tinkerton types. But it's also going it might fit one of my Dara Cool, which are the, the ghoulish half ghoul people in my vaults campaign here in the game world uh that's a cobalt press uh, creation if i if i'm remembering uh, but the dark cool that could fit one of them possibly so that's why again i like this idea a little bit of it starts making me think of ooh, instead of just uh pigeonholing everybody to oh it must be um one of the uh one of the the droog one of the durgar because they're the only ones who would worship chaos no it could be anything Anybody might have a reason. So anyway, they get unfettered movement is the a spell they can cast. That is in the player core page 305. Uh, it's an innate spell once a day. And that is similar to the, um, the I forgot the other, other spell I was mentioned before. One of the domain spells it was. The commanding, liberating command I think it was. It's similar to that one. So unfettered movement. I think it was used to be called freedom of movement or something like that. The, before the remaster. Uh, but there you go, P, uh, player core 305, freedom, right? That's what these guys are about. Fifth doctrine, disruptive defense. Additionally, once you get the fortitude saves, but on top of that, when you use that shield block, which you got earlier for one of your doctrines, uh, against the melee attack, you can emit a burst of chaotic energy to make a spell attack against the offending weapon or appendage. So you'd use the target's AC. So somebody's trying to wail on you, you have your shield block ready and so if you use that shield block reaction you can tag this on top of it and make an attack roll against whatever it was that was swinging at you even if it's somebody's body fist or something like that and if you hit you do that random energy damage type to the weapon to the limb that's equal to your 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 character level so i kind of like this idea of somebody swinging a sword at you and you just blow it to pieces or something like that or melt it or something like that because it's gonna be random energy damage right or they're fist comes in and you just shatter it with like a sonic burst breaking their bones that would be awesome final doctrine the vanguard of havoc your mastery of aramon's tenets manifests as an aura extending 10 feet around you enemies starting their turn in the aura must make a will save against your spell dc or be affected by a random condition from the lowered abilities group clumsy drained and feebled stupefied until the end of their turn so this is just always on you're just emanating this around you will save or bam you're suffering one of these one of these debilitating you know uh, conditions here all right so there you go i think that is where we're ending the second video with the the clerics of araman we're going to come back for one more video we're going to wrap this up Part three, the champions of Araman. I'm going to get some speculative uh, homebrew here because we don't have the we don't have the remastered champion yet. So I'm going to be guessing at some things. So stay tuned for that. And if you want to see, want to hear, you want to know more, like, subscribe, notify, all the basic stuff that YouTube asks you to do. Go for it. I'll see you in part three in a minute.